do do do. There we go. All right. Now we're up and running. Ah, how are you folks tonight? Let's see here. We'll let's angle this over a little bit so that the dark hallway isn't sitting there. Don't want anything to come out and jump scare you. Um, it is so good to see you tonight. I, uh, I trust that God has been good to you this week and that you are growing in Him. Uh, this has been a very interesting week uh, already for us. And um, it's had its, its ups and its downs. It's not been an outstanding week or anything. But I did have something pretty neat happen today, and maybe sometime I'll tell you about it. But uh, anyway, uh, as we're getting ready, a couple of things to remind you of. One is that we probably will get to the next study guide. So we have the bottom part of this one from last week, and then this whole one waiting to go. Okay? So we are going to get ready to get here pretty quick. Uh, when you come, uh, sign on like Daryl did. Hi, Daryl see you and uh, um, as, as time rolls on hopefully we'll we'll get a few more people hopefully this will be a, a reasonably good uh, broadcast tonight um, we are still working on the possibility of maybe getting a better uh, a better uh, device to use uh, specifically for this broadcast and other broadcasts that would require a laptop situation so um, anyhow, while, um, while we are uh, waiting for other people to come and to sign in and say hi, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer together, okay? Our Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, so much for all that you have done for us. We thank you, God, for your kindness. We thank you, God, for your benevolence. We thank you, God, for your patience. We praise you, Lord, that you are teaching us the most important lesson. That is, to some people, a very minor lesson. But when we really begin to look into it, and you really begin to teach us and show us what all of that means, God, it just, it absolutely is a whole new way of looking at things. It's a whole new way of life uh, from what we were born in. And we ask God that you continue to lead us and to teach us. Thank you for your salvation. What wonder and what wisdom, Lord, you put into the process of salvation so that a sinful people who deserve nothing but hell that there could be redeemed from among them some. And uh, we thank you, Lord. We praise you for that. And we ask you, God, to help us to walk faithfully before you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Well, uh, so far it looks like, uh, looks like we've got uh, two people besides me. And if one of those is Donna, that means, hi. that means, hi, Daryl. Oh, there's Tim. Okay, good. Good. Okay, so it's Tim and Daryl. Donna says she's still Okay. We're going to uh, pick up where we left off. And um, that is uh, question B of uh, chapter 3. So or of question three, rather, not chapter three, but question three, chapter eight. And um, just real quick, I'm going to dial that up so that I have have my electric Bible here. And it's booting up. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to pick up at verse 7 again, and we're going to read down through verse 11. And so uh, 7 to 11, starting up at 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, 
neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth within you. Okay, so we come to the, uh, the second part, which is the idea of the Spirit of God dwelling within us. Now, in the uh, first part of the passage that we read, why the flesh is what it is concerned with, and it shows us, or at least tells us from the scripture, that if we live by the flesh, we will not be able to do uh, what God wants us to do, because the flesh will not subject itself there. One is that it doesn't want to. And the other is that it can't anyway. So those that those that by the flesh are trying to please God, which there are some people out there that want to please God, but they want to do it on their own terms. And of course, you can't please God on your own terms. As we said, I think it was last week, we mentioned that in Hebrews 11:6. It says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so if it's impossible to please God without faith, then a person who is asking God uh, to do things on their terms actually has been somehow conned into or has bought into the idea of that verse in... Uh, in uh, what a wonderful name, the... the song what a wonderful name there's that verse that says you didn't want heaven without us and uh which uh, it's not biblical i mean i understand the sentiment but it's not biblical and uh, there's some people that have really bought into this idea that that not only did god send his son jesus to save us but now that he's out there trying to recruit people and begging people to, to give him a place in their heart and give them a place in their life. And so people have resulted to, or resorted rather, to this idea of, uh, of, of accommodating God because, well, God wants to save me. He wants to put me in heaven. He doesn't want me to go to hell. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, you know, what? Oh, there's grace. as I received uh, this promise of God, I, why then I can just go ahead and live however I want to. Uh, don't necessarily have to go to church unless I really want to go to church. A lot of pastors out there encouraging that too. They're out there saying, hey, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That's not true. The Bible says very specifically, if you say that you love the Father, yet you do not love your brother or sister in Christ, you are a liar, and the truth is not in you. My, my goodness sakes, that is so, so vivid. It's so bottom line. Plus, there's the scripture that says, don't forsake the gathering together of yourselves as some are in the habit of doing. Now, that one's a little, a little less... Uh, it, it has a little less punch to it okay but the scripture is very clear the love that you should have for your brothers and sisters in Christ should make you want to gather together okay so the idea that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian is not exactly true now I understand that right now there's some people that are going to church virtually uh, they're going to church over the internet like this I understand that some of it's because distance some of it's because health some of it's because other reasons. I totally understand that, and I totally get that. This is a little bit of a, of an odd situation, but at least you're gathering together, even if you're gathering together over the internet right now. So, 
I'm glad to have you with us. But we have to. that he wants to recruit us into the church so badly that he just can't bear the idea of heaven without us. Listen, folks, he already had heaven before he created anything, before he, before he said, let there be light, before he formed Adam out of the dust, he already had heaven. And it was without us, in a sense, because it was eternity past. Although, again, eternity is something you and I are still going to have a hard time wrapping our heads around. But, but in eternity past, he did not have the heavens and the earth. Because in the beginning, whatever the beginning was for us, God created the heavens and the earth. And I only said whatever it is for us because uh, I, I don't understand eternity. And that's the point I'm trying to make. I, mean, I understand that there was a beginning. And I understand that if you follow the scripture, it certainly isn't 13 and a half billion years. I totally understand that. And I have no trouble whatsoever with that. And uh, if you know me long enough, you know that I would never, uh, never promote an accommodation of, of evolution. Man has no business counseling God, nor does man have any business adding his two cents worth of science to, to God. Science just means knowledge. That's all it means. That's the word. The word science is knowledge. Okay, so so please don't misunderstand me. Okay, anyway, uh, so God already had heaven. So this idea, this little verse, and I don't mean to be picking on whoever wrote that song. I don't mean to be picking on them. I understand the sentiment, but what I'm saying is, though, that that, that is a theological statement and that theological statement is misleading a ton of people. The idea that God didn't want heaven without you and me. He already had heaven without you and me. Was it lonely for him? No, of course not. The Bible says it was not lonely at all. The Bible tells us that God and the Spirit and the Son, they were all in perfect harmony. They were in perfect fellowship, perfect community that God had created the angels and, and that uh, we understand that God created the angels with certain, certain ends in mind and created people with certain ends in mind. And all of these ends were to glorify himself, to display his glory. And you say, well, why? That sounds awfully egotistical. Well, let me ask you a question, okay? Let's take a, we're going to take a box in our imagination. We're going to take a box and we're going to put the box fill it and fill it and fill it with electricity, okay? Is that box just going to stay inert in the middle of the room? Or is at some point all of that power and all of that glory inside of that box going to have to manifest itself in some fashion? Now, I, I'm speaking in a much lesser level than we're talking about if we're talking about the glory of God. I mean, the glory of God is it's big, okay? It's bigger than electricity. But you know very well that if I put a box in the middle of the room and kept pumping electricity into it, that at some point that electricity was going, is going to have to manifest itself. Now, imagine the glory of God. Glory so great that even <laughs> infinity itself cannot contain the glory of God. It must manifest itself. And so it is manifesting itself in salvation in this age that you and I live in. That is how God is manifesting his glory because his glory must manifest. His glory cannot stay contained within infinity even. Okay, that's how great the glory of God is. And so it must manifest. And so now it's manifesting in this age in salvation. Now, since the flesh is not capable of understanding the glory of God, the Bible says that no man can see his face except that he would die. Okay, because the glory would just be too, it would be too unimaginable for you and me. We would not be able, I mean, we're fine the way things are right now. Most of us, 
Uh, you know, if we could just have a nice quiet life, go fishing, uh, go hunting a little bit, uh, if we could go to a movie every so often, if we could hang out with our friends, go to the restaurant, uh, you know, go through the week doing a job, something gainful, something, something important. Uh, if we could spend our days dreaming about what we would do if we had a million dollars, we would be perfectly fine with it. We, we really weren't looking for heaven to start with. But when somebody comes along and knocks on the, on the window and says, hey, you know, this whole, this whole life is going to end in hell. And if you don't look for some way out of this, you're going to be in big, big trouble in the end. Now, people, some of them are going to laugh it off. Some of them are going to move away. Some of them are just not going to listen to you. Some of them are going to take you seriously, and they're going to say, well, I don't want to go to hell. And so then they'll say, uh, you know, how badly does God want to save me? And then somebody comes along and says, he didn't want heaven without you. And they say, well, he really must want to save me pretty badly. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm going to be, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be good. I'll be loving. I'll read a scripture from time to time. I'll listen to Caleb. I'll, I'll uh, you know, maybe listen to some gospel music from time to time. Uh, I will love my neighbor. I will reach out to other people. And if I see a guy on the street that needs five bucks, I'll give him five bucks. Uh, you know, I'll be a great guy. And, and uh, then at the tail end, why, hopefully my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds and, and I'll be okay. But that's not what the scripture is telling you. The scripture is not telling you that God wants you in heaven so bad he's willing to compromise. What the scripture is telling you is that you are in danger and that you need salvation. It's not a possibility that you, by your own understanding and by your own ability, even equipped with the Bible, it's not even a possibility that you're going to be able to save yourself. You could be the most biblically knowledgeable person in hell one day if you do not go through Christ and if you do not allow God to convert you. Now, I say allow God as if God, as if you're preventing it from happening. That's just a product of my old way of discussing salvation and I ask for your apology for that. Or your forgiveness my apologies your forgiveness okay because really what happens is that God either converts you or he doesn't and if you want conversion you need to seek him out you need to you you need to pray you need to repent you need to find God you need to seek for him the Bible says if you seek for me you will find me if you seek for me with your whole heart so God is God is there, God is available, God wants you to seek him out, but he's not going to come and beg you to come into heaven. Therefore, we have this question, if the Spirit of Christ is within us, then what should that mean and how should we live? There are two ways that a person might live. One is by the flesh, the other is by the Spirit. Only a converted person has the option of living by the Spirit. Only a converted person. And that person only converted by the power of God. Not converted because some guy outsmarted them in a debate. Not converted because some guy came with a four spiritual laws tract and had you sign the back and, and write the date and say, today's your spiritual birthday. Okay? It's not because a salesman sold you religion. It's not because somebody recruited you into church. It's not because of any of those lesser and ineffective ways. It is because the power of God 
has come upon you and converted you. And God has then deposited his Holy Spirit in you. Now listen, if if you tell me, and this is, I'm borrowing an illustration from Paul Washer. I watch him, I, I, I watch him and uh, I gain a lot from his ministry. Okay, but he's not the only one. Okay, I watch others, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul, Steve, um, what's his last name, but anyways, just to give you an idea. Okay, but Paul Washer says this. Taking a look at you, and I don't see any change whatsoever. I'm going to tell you that you're a liar. Because you cannot have an encounter with a Mack truck and it not change you. Okay. Now, in the, that's the, now, what he's trying to say is that when the Spirit of God fills you, it makes a distinct change in who you are. But there's no significant change in your life. You know, someone uh, who was, I don't know if it was Leonard Ravenhill originally that said this, but somebody said, uh, if you, you say you're saved, well, saved from what? Saved from what? Are you saved from, are you saved from lust? Are you saved from, from lying? Are you saved from, you know, what are you saved from? And uh, that's a good question. You know, now I can go back through my life and I can easily show you how I have grown since I've become a Christian. My wife could testify to it. She has watched me grow. And I don't grow, you know, like this. You grow like this. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's a constant up and down, up and down. But it's not all the way up and all the way down. It's up a little, down a little, up further, down a little, but up further and down a little, until eventually you find that cumulatively God has been sanctifying you, and some of the downs that you used to drop to, you just don't drop to anymore. But you're always reaching new heights in the Lord. You know, there's that uh, that hymn, uh, Higher Ground, you know, New Heights I'm Gaining Every Day. Now, that's, that's absolutely true. I have, never, I have never been as well off in the Lord as I am today. And tomorrow, I'm going to be even more well off in the Lord because of God's power. Because of God's sanctification. Because of His program. Not because I, of mine. I go to the Lord constantly. And I say, I don't even know why you love me. And I look at my own sins and I go, oh, oh my, you know, if I could just be a better person, if I could just, if, you know, and then I have to remember his grace is sufficient for me. Okay, now, if the Spirit of Christ is within you and God puts the Spirit of Christ in you, the first thing that I say, as far as what does that mean, is it means change. It means the righteousness you used to hate or take lightly, you now take very seriously in love. The sin that you used to take lightly and even love, you now hate. And you're trying to get as far away from your sinful past as you possibly can. Okay? So there's two things that we know. One is that when the Holy Spirit is within you, there's a distinct change. A distinct change in, in the way you look at life, the dis, a distinct change in the way you, you look at the Bible, a distinct change in so many different areas. Okay? And you don't find yourself satisfied any longer with the world. In fact, the more you grow in the Lord, the more you feel alienated from the world. When you first got saved, <laughs> you, feel, you, you felt alienated from God and you felt close to the world. Now, as you've walked with the Lord for a few years, you begin to find that, you, that you're liking the world less and less, and you're longing for heaven more and more. This is another thing.
Dr. Sound. So if I was a Christian, I would read my Bible. I still have my little black Bible that I got when I was three years old. It says it right there in the cover. 1968 for Sunday school attendance. Well, at three years old, I didn't have much choice. So unless my mom was sick, I pretty much was going to be there at church. But I got that black Bible, and I used to read that and read that and read that. And then I got a green Bible, which I still have. And in fact, I, I use uh, still today. It's a, a green uh, King James Version. And, and, and I would read that and read that and read that when I was a kid. And none of it made any sense to me unless I read a Sunday school story or, uh, or maybe went through the, the Beatitudes and there was some moral lessons or something. But it really meant very little to me at all. It had very little effect on me. When I was 19, I was converted by the power of God. The Holy Spirit was, de was deposited into me. And I felt him come in at the same time that it was, I don't know if it was what I was rushing out or what he was rushing in. But when the Holy Spirit came into my life, came into my, my being, why there was no room left at the age of 19 God for the first time spoke through the Bible to me. It was the greatest miracle. Hear the Bible preached. I can't wait to read the Bible. I can't wait to ponder the Bible. I can't wait to share the Bible because the easy. Do you realize it's impossible? Even armed with the Bible, it is impossible for you not to corrupt what you're reading. That's, that's a devastating fact. And it's true. That's why the Bible says Holy Bible. Those who initially called it that, they were calling it that specifically because they were trying to remind the one that approached the Bible, this is holy. <coughs> and so then if we read it and we corrupt it with our own understanding, although there's a, there is a kind of a, a prevailing grace of God for people who read the Bible and don't understand it, there is still a great deal of blasphemy that without un intending, your brain just fashions all of these blasphemies based upon what you're reading applied to your mind and subjected to your under own understanding. So uh, having the spirit within you, it changes you, it, it, it makes you love righteousness rather than hate it. Uh, it, it. It is a specific, deliberate uh, deposit from God that comes at conversion. And how should we live at that point then? Well, we should live by the Spirit. That means reading the Scripture, great miracle, okay, and receiving from the Spirit of God from the Scripture. It means praying and receiving from the Spirit of God in prayer what it is that God the Father is wanting for you to know at the moment. It also means uh, following the inner leading of the Holy Spirit uh, as he says to you uh, different things like call so-and-so, uh, you know, take a different route today, you know, listen, turn on the radio, um, okay, now I'm going to tell you, I think because it's fitting, I'm going to tell you a little something about today. Okay, my printer, my, my copier, it's, it's new. We've only had it for a month. 
and uh, very strange. I went to print, and it was only printing one quadrant. If you were to separate a page into four quadrants, it would have been the upper left quadrant. So I eventually, after trying everything I knew to try and figure out what the problem was and finding no solution, I called HP. Okay, long story short, um, I, I talked with a, with a gentleman, and uh, at one point he took over with the computer and Um, he was looking at one of my sermons because it was up on the screen because I was printing it as an other, a different document than the one I... And he began to make a, what I could only say was joyful noise and was kind of giggling and making joyful noise. Now, this was the, the uh, sermon I just preached on Sunday, Pigs in the Pulpit. And... He and, I, he and I wound up in a conversation about the Lord because he said that what he was reading, just that little bit that he was reading, had, was restoring his faith and he could feel the, that, the God was, that God was moving on him, that he had, had been discouraged and he was struggling. And you got to, I, I, I don't know how to tell you how amazing that is for me because because here, you know, here this printer just all of a sudden had a problem. And off I go, following the situation, and the Holy Spirit leads me to a fellow that needed, and of all of the documents that I could have chosen to print at the last, happened to be a document that had some words and some scripture that, that uh, brought joy to his heart, and we were able to talk for a little bit, um, you know, a reasonable amount of time. Uh, about about salvation and about and about Christianity, fantastic experience. I'm never going to forget that for as long as I live. Okay, and uh, he was thanking me. I should have been thanking him, because you know he, it was it was incredible. But that's what walking by the Spirit is. Okay, that's. Then more training, application, training to application, and God begins to do amazing things when you allow him to work through you and to do these things. I, I wasn't looking for the situation today, but God brought it there, and I was so thrilled, and I'm grateful to the Lord, and, and I'm grateful to uh, to the fellow that I talked to as well. Um, looking at now at verses 12 to 17 in Romans. Starting at verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now, I'm just going to stop there at the first half of verse 17 because this is one of those verses that ends an idea and then begins a new sub-idea, and I, and I don't want to have all that extra confusion right now. Okay? Um, so let's talk about this. Uh, we're debtors. Okay, debtors to the spirit not debtors to the flesh we do not have to fulfill the desires of the flesh now let's look at it this way okay our worthy desires and some of them are very dirty dark desires 
okay? And they're all flesh, you know, because the flesh is not, the, the, the flesh is not uh, uh, either holy or not holy. The flesh can never be holy. So whatever the flesh thinks, sometimes it thinks better thoughts, sometimes it thinks worse thoughts, sometimes it desires, uh, you know, love and care and compassion and things. Other times it it desires to take advantage of life's various goodies or delicacies, as as the case may be. And so what what often happens as a result of that is that uh, we get when we get saved when we get converted and we're asked now to live for the dreams of Christ the hopes and the dreams of Jesus Christ we find our we find our flesh going yeah but what about that idea what about that dream what about that goal what about that thing we wanted to do before we died what about that bucket list and so then we find ourselves going, ah, oh, yeah, that's right. I had this bucket list of things I wanted to do. Well, you know, heaven is, you know, it's it's a long ways out. Uh, why, uh, yeah, let's just work on this bucket list. And, and then one of these days, why, I'll have the time and I'll have the energy. And, and uh, then, I'll, then I'll, 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 I'll dedicate some time to to helping God with his stuff. He's a big God. He can take care of it. And so what happens is we find ourselves making ourselves debtors to the flesh. And so we, so now that we're saved, we say, well, now that we're saved, now that I'm going to go to heaven, oh, I still have all these hopes and dreams I never accomplished. And so we go back to those hopes and dreams trying to accomplish them. And they were not the dreams and the hopes that God had for us. They were the ones we had for ourselves. Then we find ourselves in an argument with God. But I wanted to do this, but I always dreamed of that, but I desired to have that. And you know what God usually does? God's got all the time in the world. I say, okay, go ahead, chase after those things. Go ahead. See if they, see if they make you as happy as you thought. And what happens is we find ourselves chasing after these dreams, living as debtors to the flesh, not living as debtors to the Spirit of God, but as debtors to the flesh. And then all of a sudden, our lives start to fall apart. You know, we chase after this thing, and it becomes sour while we're eating it. It tasted sweet at first, and now it's just becoming sour to us. Um, or or we, uh, we, we think that that we know what we want, we get it, and we go, this wasn't nearly as great as I thought. Okay, now what happens then is that we begin living after the flesh, and as the scripture says, if you keep living after the flesh, you're going to die. Now that doesn't mean physically, that means spiritually. We're all going to die physically. Okay, unless, of course, the Lord comes back and we're translated and all of that stuff, but but this is talking about spiritual death. I, I understand that our salvation is secure in Christ. I understand that. And I'm not saying that a person can lose their salvation, except that the Bible says there's one caveat, one. And that is that you must continue in the faith by which you were saved. Now that makes sense. That makes sense. If you claim salvation, but you live for the flesh, you're going to die. Now, if you're filled with the Spirit, will you be able to live by the flesh for very long? No. No, not at all. The Holy Spirit is going to seize a hold of your heart. And the things that you're doing, the things that are displeasing to God, the things that are goals and dreams and hopes that are not God's goals and dreams and hopes. The Holy Spirit is going to get a hold of you. He's going to grab you by the collar, and he's going to say, hey, buddy, get back over here. Okay? So a person who is walking by the flesh, even though they are filled with the Spirit, is going to find the Holy Spirit taking them and correcting them. As it says in, uh, in Isaiah, in that day there will be a voice coming from behind you saying, here is the way, walk in it. 
So if we swerve off to the left or off to the right, the Lord always calls us back to the center of his will. He never lets us stray for very long. But if you claim faith and you say that you know the Lord and you claim faith and you live as a debtor to the flesh and you have, I mean, the Holy Spirit literally does not do anything to bring you back. Doesn't touch you at all. Doesn't bug your conscience. <coughs> nothing then that is because either you have resisted him to the point at which he's going to let you completely crash, or it is because you don't even know him at all. And this is something that should concern you. It's something that concerns me. <laughs> it concerns me. And now I've, I've gone through my own experiences, and um, that's not something I'm going to share tonight, but but I've gone through my own experiences and you're going through your own experiences as well. If the Lord loves you, the Lord is going to discipline you, but the Lord is not going to abandon you. If you don't, if you don't really know the Lord or the Lord doesn't really know you in that sense, why then he's just going to let you do whatever you want to do and he's not even going to try. Okay, now if you want to go to heaven, at some point you're going to have to come to your senses. But... But uh, the scripture is very clear. If you continue to live by the flesh, you will die. And the Bible also is clear that if you do not have the Holy Spirit, then you are not, you do not belong to God. So, uh, so in, the, in the sense that, we're, that we are discussing that in the scripture, it's easy for us to say then from the scripture that anyone who is a converted believer, a true child of God has the Spirit of God in them. Okay, there's no such thing as somebody who is a Christian but just needs to be filled with the Spirit or just needs the Holy Spirit and doesn't have the Holy Spirit. That's not, that's not biblical. Not at all. Okay, that's something that, that people who are doing recruitment evangelism came up with because they're like, okay, we get them into the church, but they're still living worldly. So we need to disciple them so they'll stop living worldly. They get them to calm down. They get them to manage themselves pretty well. But then they, then they know that these people are not experiencing the Holy Spirit. They're not reading the Bible. They're not, they're not getting anything out of the Bible. And so then the next uh, fallacy is, oh, well, they're Christians, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not what the scripture says. Okay, if you are a converted believer, you do have the Holy Spirit. Okay, and you are not going to like not have the Holy Spirit. It just doesn't happen. Okay, so this idea that that a believer just needs the Holy Spirit is not accurate. Um, why do you suppose that God gives us his spirit, but the flesh remains sinful? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Why does he give us our spirit, but the flesh remains sinful? Well, according to the scripture, it is because the flesh still is under the headship of Adam. Okay, your body, your mind, your soul, your body, that trinity of who you are is under the headship of Adam. Now, the spirit of God that has been placed in you, which has ev evicted the sin nature and has brought you alive in Christ that has given you an eternal uh, an eternal life that you did not have before now one of these days your body is going to die it's going to perish and then it will have uh, suffered the justice do it from the time of Adam okay and so then your flesh, your mind, your soul, your body, which has been trained by the sin nature, continues to do that which it was trained to do. And so therefore, the Bible says, you have to mortify the deeds of the body through, the, through living in the Holy Spirit. So this is the opposite of what we were talking about earlier, 
being a debtor to the flesh. Okay, because if you're a debtor to the flesh, thinking to yourself, oh, there's all these things I wanted to do, all the, you know, I'll get back to God once I've done and, and have kept my obligation to my old dreams, my old hopes, and my old desires. Okay, opposite of that is that instead, living by the Spirit, you're living for the dreams of Christ. You're living for his, what, what's his big dream? Seek and save that which was lost. That's his biggest dream right there. But serving God is an obedient servant. <coughs> that's, a, that's a lifestyle. And God is calling you to that lifestyle. You can't, just, you can't just simply claim Christianity and then go back to being a debtor to the flesh. No, you need to be a debtor to the Holy Spirit. He saved you. He's the one that pulled your fat out of the fryer. Okay, and since he's the one that did it, you had ought to be grateful and you had ought to begin serving him with everything that you have in you. Now, the Bible has uh, instructions for how to serve him in the job that you already have. Serving God doesn't mean you have to leave your job and become some kind of a monk or some kind of an ascetic. Okay, what the scripture means is that serving God with all your heart, mind, and soul uh, is is walking faithfully in your job, in your family, in all of the situations that you use to use in order to satisfy your flesh. Now you're going to use the spirit in order to strengthen the people who depend on you in those situations. Uh, if, if you're a husband like I am, you use, you use your, the Holy Spirit's life in you to strengthen and to help the lives of your family. You come underneath of your wife and you help her to, to have a great life. You come, un, you come underneath of your kids and you help your kids to have a great life. If you work for someone, you go to work with the idea of, I am gonna work so hard that, that I'm going to take as much stress off of my boss as I possibly can. And then you go home Regardless of the paycheck, regardless of the amount of money, you go home knowing that what you are being paid is, in, is of far greater value than a paycheck or pats on the back. Because if you are aware of what salvation has done for you, you realize that if you were to die tomorrow, none of the other things would matter anyways. Because you know you would be with the Lord. You have that assurance now, a person who walks through this world with the Spirit of God in them has, has far, far more, immeasurably more than any man, woman, or child on the face of this earth, including the rich and including the happy poor. We have way more. We, we don't need anything from them anymore. We don't, we don't need their money. We don't need their accolades. We don't need their pats on the back. We don't need their attaboys anymore. We don't need any of that. What we, what we want to do right now is seek and save that which was lost and be an obedient servant to the Lord in every area of life. We don't need this world any longer. We understand its fate. We understand it's it's that the worth of god the worth of the kingdom of god is of incomparable riches compared to this world and so since we understand that and we're fully convinced of it we live by the spirit and therefore therefore we do mortify the deeds of the flesh last question on this uh, study guide what does it mean to have the spirit of adoption Okay, now the scripture here says the spirit of adoption which causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. Okay, the spirit of adoption. Now this, in, in a sense here, is uh, not a particular spirit. Okay, not like an angel or an angelic spirit. What we see here is the capital S, which means the Holy Spirit. Okay, and so the Holy Spirit comes into us. And the Holy Spirit causes us to believe without a doubt 
that we are God's children. And since God's children, we do not have to any longer feel abandoned or feel like we're out there on our own trying to get something done or trying to achieve something for God, but that we're actually adopted. We are actually a part of his family. We're actually his children. And we understand if we read enough of the scripture, we understand how that is. We're, we're like, according to Exodus chapter 21, we, we are like a slave daughter. We were slaves to sin when God found us. We're like a slave woman that God wants to give to his son, Jesus, for marriage. And according to God's law, in Exodus chapter 21, if he takes us to be the bride, that means the church, to be the bride for Christ, he must give us the rights of a daughter. In other words, he must take us to himself as if we were his own child. Okay? So we have the assurance of the law. We have the assurance of the blood of Christ. We have the assurance of the Holy Spirit. And these three things fulfill the scripture that says a matter must be established in the presence of two or three witnesses. And so we have these three witnesses. All right? And these three witnesses are enough. The Bible says in 1 John that it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all that witness. And, of course, the uh, NIV, they they said, well, it doesn't really mean the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It means, uh, you know, the, the water and baptism and all of this. Okay. Uh, fine and dandy, but but uh, the King James translation was there first. I tend to, um, I tend to uh, defer to that. Uh, whenever there is a conflict. And uh, although I understand what the interpreters were trying to do when they came up with that in the NIV, I don't, I don't believe that that is the best interpretation. You know, that's just, you know, just me do with it what you will. But um, anyway, uh, so the spirit of adoption here means the Holy Spirit dwelling in you gives you the assurance and this and again I said that we have the law and we have the blood of Christ and we have the presence of the Holy Spirit these three things witness together okay that that if you have been converted you are a child of God okay where are we now okay we are going to get started on the new study guide just at the top here. We're going to start out with 17 again, but this time that second part of the verse that I left out. I don't know that we'll get through uh, all three of these sub-questions to number one, but we'll at least get started on it, okay? Here we go. Now, again, verse 17, I'll read the part that we did read before so that we can get the whole gist of the verse. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may all be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Okay, we're going to pause there. How is it possible that the greatest suffering of this life will seem so small a price for knowing God's glory. Here is something that should, it, it should really make you stop and, and think. Because I can, I can imagine great suffering. I can imagine suffering that would 
that 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 would just chill your bones. Um, there's different things that they said that the uh, apostles faced as their deaths. One of them was being boiled in oil. Another was having his uh, was said that they that somebody had taken and peeled skin off of him while he was alive. Uh, other types of of uh, horrible, torturous death. And, uh, of course, we know also from the Inquisition uh, some horrible, torturous ways that they killed people. Uh, just things that you just don't even want to, just don't even want to dwell on. I can imagine great suffering. I cannot imagine even the lightest of glory. I can't <coughs> because this flesh only knows suffering or not suffering this flesh does not know glory so if we only can know if we can only know suffering or not suffering we would rather know not suffering because to know suffering is frightening so if all we know is one of the other and we don't even know what glory is, the Bible assures us that even the smallest bit of God's glory will make the greatest <laughs> suffering that mankind could possibly imagine seem like a very small price to pay. It's exactly what the scripture is saying here. When it says that, when it says in verse 18, it says, for the earnest expectation, or wait, no. Um, it says uh, in verse 17, it is. Oh, no, 18. Okay, I saw 19. I thought it was 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay, that's the way it's actually worded. I, I reworded it a little. It is to put it, basically what it's trying to tell us is that the greatest suffering you can imagine is going to seem like the smallest price in the world compared to the least bit of God's glory. I can't imagine that. I'm sorry, but I can't. I, I cannot say, oh, this is what God's glory is like. I haven't experienced it yet. I've experienced the, the Lord interacting with me. I've experienced the Lord revealing some of, of who he is to me. I've experienced the Lord's discipline. I have experienced the Lord's kindness. I have experienced many things of the Lord. But his glory? Not even a drop of it in all of my life. I've experienced his compassion and I've experienced his love, I've experienced his presence. But not even a drop of glory. Why? Because as long as I am on this side of heaven, there's so much corruption, I'm not even going to get a drop of his glory on this side of heaven, except for his divine will. We see it in the in the scripture. We see that Moses was allowed to see the back of God, as it were, although God, <coughs> God is a spirit and doesn't actually have a body the way that you and I do. But he was allowed not to see his face, but to see the back end of his glory. And we know that the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, the disciples saw a glorified Christ. We know that after the resurrection, uh, they saw his glorified body. We understand those things, but we also understand that these are not the normal for everyone. Okay, Isaiah saw the glory of God. John saw the glory of God in Revelation. Other prophets uh, received visions from the Lord. Sometimes the prophets, though, all they received was a message from the Lord. Okay, so, so for us to say that that we have any idea of what the glory of God is, the normal, everyday Joe Christian 
has no concept. And even if somebody was trying to try and describe it to you, have you ever read Ezekiel's description of what he saw? The throne of God moving around through the earth with these wheels within wheels and and living creatures next to the wheels and whenever the creatures would move, the wheels would move and, and all of this. Have you ever read that? Uh, cre you know, seraphim with eyes all over themselves even underneath of their wings and all of, I don't get that I don't I don't there's a lot of that stuff I don't get now I can tell you what it probably represents <coughs> I can tell you what the symbolism means but even when Isaiah describes it to us if you've never experienced it you just don't get it it's just all there is to it well, that gets only A done, so at least next week I won't have to post a whole new uh, study guide for you. But uh, uh, God's blessings on you folks. It's good to see you. And uh, I know that we've had ups and downs as far as the numbers of people viewing. I trust, though, this was a reasonably good uh, broadcast tonight. I didn't hear anybody or see anybody telling me that we were in trouble. So, let's uh, bow our heads for a word of prayer, okay? Merciful Father, how could we ever know even the least bit of truth unless you had given us your Bible? We're amazed. We love you. God, help us to follow you and to be faithful to you. Be with those, Lord, that have viewed tonight, some that have checked in for a little bit and then left, others that were scrolling through their phones and I happened to start speaking a little and maybe they stopped for two seconds and then moved on. But God, I know that you don't send your word forth without it achieving everything that you intended for it to achieve. And so, Father, I pray that you would do exactly everything, Lord, that you had in mind to do. Thank you, Lord, for those that faithfully come to the Bible study, and I ask your blessings on them as well. Be with us, Lord, through the week, and gather us together again on Sunday, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you once again for coming to Bible study, and uh, any time that you want to try and share this on your Facebook and tell other people about it, um, the more people come, the merrier it is. So, in the meantime, God bless you and have a good night. We'll see you Sunday, either by video or in person.